We all use this money every single day, but we're never taught how to actually use this money or how to turn this money into a second stream of cash flow or how to turn this money into true generational wealth. But that changes today. In this video, I'm going to go over the 10 things you need to do so you can build wealth and never have to worry about money again. And I guarantee that this will work if you actually follow these 10 things in this order. The 10 things are number one, developing your wealth mindset. Number two, understanding the rules of money. Number three, how do you save your first $2,000 and build your saving system? Number four, pay off your credit card debt. Number five, understanding how you build a system for your finances and your money coming in. Now, number six, how do you actually invest your money, generate cash flow? How do you build wealth? How do you appreciate the value of your money? Number seven, how do you spend your money smartly? Number eight, how do you now earn more money strategically to grow your financial system. Number nine, how do you protect your assets? As an attorney, who's well, not your attorney, what I can tell you is when people realize you have money, they're gonna wanna take their hands, put it in your pockets and take some of it for themselves. So I'm gonna show you different ways that you can protect your assets. And then number 10, how do you leave a real legacy through your wealth? So let's break this all down, going through this one by one, starting with number one, building the mindset to become wealthy. You have to be wealthy in your mind before you can see this wealth in your bank account. And in order to have this wealthy mindset, and no, I'm not talking about that woo woo, hippy dippy stuff. I'm talking about real understanding how you become wealthy. If you wanna have that successful mindset, there are four things that you have to understand and adopt and believe and say. Number one, I will become wealthy. Not that I can, not that I might, I will become wealthy. Number two, money is a tool. Money doesn't make you bad, money doesn't make you evil, money doesn't make you good, it's just a tool. Number three, money is abundant. There's a lot of money out there. And if you live in this limited scarcity mindset, you're never gonna become wealthy. And number four, it is my duty. It is your duty to become wealthy. Not somebody else's job, it is your job. It is my job to become wealthy. Now I've already talked about this. You have to believe that you're gonna become wealthy before you actually become wealthy. But I wanna go deeper here into how money is a tool because many of us put up a smoke screen when it comes to the topic of money. That when people start talking about money, we get uneasy, we get uncomfortable and we say money doesn't matter, money's bad, rich people are evil, they must have done something slimy or greedy to get there. And the reason why so many people do that and the reason why so many of us grow up in a household where money is taboo and evil and bad is because most people are insecure about their own money. And in order to understand that money is just a tool, you have to understand how money plays a part in your life. And one of the things that I like to talk about is my quadrifid theory, which says if you want to live a happy and fulfilled life, there are four fitnesses that you have to adopt. Number one, at the bottom, at the base, you have to be physically fit. Because if you're on your deathbed, nobody cares about how much money they have in the bank account. All they wanna do is feel healthy again. When you're not healthy, all you want is to be healthy. Number two is you have to be mentally fit. Now there's a lot of definitions for mental fitness. This could mean feeling happy, not being depressed, not being anxious, but it's being content and happy with what you have. And more money isn't gonna make you happy per se. More money can solve the financial problems in your life. I am not one of those people that say money does not matter. It absolutely matters because if you don't have money, it can destroy your mental health. But there's a difference between being stressed over money and being depressed and anxious and unhappy and surrounded by toxic people. So if you are having this mental unfitness, you have to invest in this, whether it's getting therapy, whether it's cutting some people out of your life, whether it's figuring out how you can actually have the happiness, you have to invest in that here. Number three is your spiritual fitness. This doesn't have to mean religion. It's what is your purpose? Because if you do have $10 million in your bank account, now what? What's your reason to get out of bed in the morning? What's your reason to get excited and go up and do things? You have to have a purpose. What's your reason for getting up every single day? And then at the top is your financial fitness. Now, your financial fitness matters. A lot of people like to run around the internet talking about how money doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about money. But the only people that say money doesn't matter are people that are already rich or it's people that are delusional. Because the reality is it costs money to eat and it costs money to feed other people. Whether you want to take your kids to Disney World, whether you want to buy your wife a new purse, whether you want to take better care of your parents, or you want to do something nice for yourself, it costs money to do that. And if you say, well, I just want to take care of the world. I want to feed hungry people. Great. That's very noble of you. But that food costs money as well. The more money you have, the more money you can do and the more people that you can help. That's how money is a tool. Which brings us to number three. Money is abundant. The reality is there's a lot of money in the world. If you've been following my channel, if you've been reading market briefs, you know that there's a lot of money out there. 
I mean, the United States government has over $35 trillion of national debt. All you need is a small sliver of it. And what many people get caught up with is many people focus in on what somebody else is getting. If I pay you a dollar, that means you're getting a dollar and I'm losing a dollar. You're so focused on these small transactional things as opposed to understanding how you can grow the pie. How can you figure out how you can grow how much money you earn? Because if you can spend a dollar to earn two dollars, well now it's a win-win transaction. And this is the type of thing you want to be thinking about. How can you work to grow your pie, grow your mindset, grow your wealth? You have to start thinking in abundance as opposed to scarcity. That way you can think in bigger terms and in bigger wealth numbers. And then of course, it is my duty to become wealthy. It's not anybody else's job to make you wealthy. It is up to you to make yourself wealthy. Once you build the right mindset, now you have to understand the rules of money. And I promise we're going to get into what you actually do with the dollars that you earn in just a second. But you have to understand the rules of money because most people are playing the game of money without understanding how it works. There are three rules of money that every single one of us should have learned before we graduated high school. And they are number one, money flows to the investor. Number two, Inflation brings more dollars to the investor. And number three, our tax code benefits the investor. We're all taught to go to school, to get good grades, to get a good job. But our economic system is designed to benefit the investor. Let me show you exactly what I mean. Our economic system is comprised of what I like to call three different entities. They are the consumer, the investor, and then the businesses. Every single person is a consumer. Rich people, middle class people, poor people, everybody's a consumer because everybody's got to eat. And so what happens is consumers go to a business to spend money. You go to Chipotle and you buy yourself a bowl plus extra guac. Now, when you spend money at the business, the profits flow to the investor. So the more money and more guac you buy, the more money that flows to the investor, which is rule number one, money flows to investors. When you go and spend money at a business, that is benefiting the investors, the owners of the business. And the owners are, of course, the investors. The second rule is that inflation benefits the investor. What does inflation do? Inflation makes things more expensive. Over the last number of years, guacamole has become a whole lot more expensive. That means you as a consumer have to spend more dollars at that business buying that stuff. And so as more dollars go into the hands of the business, more dollars flow into the hands of the investor as well. If we take a look at the last five years between 2019 to 2024, what we have seen happen is that the average income has grown by around 18%. The average inflation rate, the reported average inflation rate, not the real inflation rate, but the reported inflation rate is about 23% versus the stock market, the S&P 500 over the same five years has grown by over 80%. As we have seen incomes rise a little bit, inflation has grown faster than that, but the real winner in that system were the investors. Now you might say, well, we're just talking about this period post pandemic, but this has been going on for way before the pandemic. If we took a look at what has happened between 1971 to 2021, which is before we saw the real boom in inflation over those five decades between 1971 and 2021, we saw household income grow by around 600%. The price of a new car had grown by around 840%. The cost to buy a median home has grown by a little bit over 1200%. And the cost of attending one year in a public four year university has grown by around 2000%. And we saw the S&P 500, the stock market grow by around 4000%. So who won? The investor. And then of course we have the tax code, which is designed to benefit the investor. Now, although I am a licensed attorney, I'm not your attorney, but what I can tell you is that when you are an investor, you get to qualify for lower tax rates or higher tax breaks that you don't get when you are an employee. For example, in 2024, the CEO of Coca-Cola is estimated to make around $8 million in cash compensation. That's things like salary and bonuses, actual cash that he gets in his pocket. He's gonna get other forms of compensation like equity, but I'm gonna focus just on the salary. So about $8 million in salary versus Warren Buffett, who is an investor in Coca-Cola, is gonna make over $700 million in 2024 from dividends. That's cash payments he gets for owning the Coca-Cola stock. 
Now, my goal with telling you this isn't to show you the earning potential as an investor, but to focus in on the tax code because James Quincy, who is the CEO of Coca-Cola, is making a lot of money. And because he's making a lot of money, he's gonna have to pay the top federal tax rate of 37%. But Warren Buffett, who's gonna make many times more than the CEO of James Quincy, made his money as an investor, not as an employee. And because he made his money as an investor, not an employee, he can make many times more money, but his top tax rate is 20%. The tax code is designed to benefit the investor, but we're all told to make more money as an employee, when in reality, our economic system is designed to benefit the investor, which is why you want to be an investor so you can actually build wealth, which brings us now to number three. Now it's time to get practical, and you gotta start by saving a little bit of money. You gotta start by saving $2,000, and if you're already very far along in the journey, don't worry, because it's gonna get more advanced as we get down here. But in the very beginning, you gotta start by saving a little bit of money, because the reality is the average American today has less than $1,000 sitting in their savings account. Now if that's you, or if you have credit card debt, this is what I call the financial danger zone. And in this financial danger zone, if you have credit card debt, or if you have under $2,000 saved to protect you against an emergency, I'm not talking about just $2,000. I mean $2,000 extra in a savings account that's there just to protect you against an emergency. It's not there to buy you something, it's there just to protect you. If you don't have that, then you are in what I call the financial danger zone, which means you have to get extremely serious at this point in your life to sell whatever you can, spend as little money as possible, stop going to dinners, stop going on vacations, stop spending money and work to earn more money during this phase because you have to get out of the financial danger zone as fast as possible. So if you don't have $2,000 saved, no more vacations, no more eating out, no more fancy fun stuff until you save that $2,000 and during this financial danger zone, no Netflix. Now, a lot of people get angry when I say this, but I don't make these videos to get you to like me. I say these videos to help spread financial education, to help you be better with money, because the reality is, if you have the Netflix subscription, when you are in this financial danger zone, my concern is not the 10 or $15 a month. My concern is the two hours a day you're spending on Netflix, because the average American today is spending more than two hours a day watching TV, things like Netflix. But if you don't have $2,000, or if you have credit card debt, you cannot afford to waste that time. That time needs to be spent learning. Learning about earning money, learning about investing money, learning about saving money, finding ways to find some extra cash. You have to get very serious on that because if you are in this financial danger zone, I don't know how you are comfortable sleeping a full eight hours a night because right now you gotta get serious about saving this $2,000 and then paying off this credit card debt. And this brings me to point number four, which is now how do you actually pay off this credit card debt and find this extra money to save this $2,000 and pay down the credit card debt as fast as possible. If you have $8,000 with the credit card debt, which is less than what the average American household with credit card debt has, and you're making the minimum monthly payment of $200 a month, and your average APR is 25% a year, which is what many credit cards charge nowadays, that means that not only are you gonna have to pay this $8,000 back, but then on top of this, you're gonna pay an additional $9,300 in interest. It's actually a little bit higher than this, but I'm rounding down. That means you're gonna pay more money in interest to Visa, MasterCard, and Amex in order to finance that Gucci that you couldn't afford in the first place. This is why your credit card debt is so expensive and why I hold so many people back from ever building wealth because you're paying these insane interest rates to make somebody else rich. You are the person that's funding those private jets for the credit card companies. You are the one that's funding all those amazing perks and rewards for the credit card companies. I use a credit card for all of my transactions, but I refuse to pay a penny in interest because I wanna pay off my balance in full on time every month. That way I can get the perks, rewards, and cash back and not have to be the one that pays this interest. And if you're the one that's paying the interest, you're the one that's paying for other people's perks, rewards, and benefits, but you're also paying for this private jets. So how do you get out of credit card debt? Now again, you have two options. Either you can spend less or you can work to earn more. And during this phase, you are in what's called the financial danger zone. And so you have to get very serious and very diligent about trying to pay this off as fast as humanly possible. So you might have to take on some extra shifts, find some extra ways to make some more money. Find a second job, find a weekend job, find a way to earn some more money, not so you can have some more fancy stuff, but so you can pay off the credit card debt faster. While you're working to earn more money, you gotta cut back on your expenses. 
I already talked to you about different ways to do that, but now you can also get more creative. Find ways to lower some of your bills. Maybe now you're gonna call your utility bills, your phone bill, your internet bill, and see if they can negotiate your bill lower. Yes, it is possible. Maybe you gotta go out and sell some of your stuff. Every single person, I don't care who you are, if you're watching this video, you have something that you can sell in your house. Go out and start selling it. Get some more cash, that way you can pay down this credit card debt faster, because once you get out of credit card debt, now you can actually start building wealth instead of just trying to get to the starting point. This is where things get fun because now we can talk about number five, building a financial system. Now that you have at least a couple thousand dollars saved to protect you against an emergency and that you don't have any credit card debt, now you can start systemizing your money that we can actually build wealth. And one of the things that you can do is create an automation where now every time you get paid, your money should be deposited into three different bank accounts. And that is number one, this is your spending account with a maximum of 75 cents for every dollar that you earn. Number two is your investment money, which should hold a minimum of 15 cents of every dollar that you earn. And the third is your savings money, which will hold a minimum of 10 cents for every dollar that you earn. This is my 75, 15, 10 plan. Now what this says is every time you get paid, whether you make a dollar or a million dollars, this money is gonna be automatically divided up. Many banks will allow you to open these three different bank accounts and automate the transfer of money from one bank account to the other. This way, anytime you get paid, your money will automatically be divided. The reason why you wanna have three different bank accounts is so you do not accidentally spend your investment money, so don't accidentally spend your savings money. This is the money that you can spend. And when you don't see this money, you're not gonna be tempted to spend it. This is the money that you're gonna to invest to make you wealthy. This is the money that you're gonna to save to protect you against an emergency. You have to have all three of these if you wanna build wealth. And yes, you wanna have three different bank accounts. That way now, no matter how much money you earn, you're always saving some money, you're always investing some money, and then you spend whatever's left. This is the difference between wealthy people and everybody else. Wealthy people always, no matter what, put money aside to invest and save before they spend all their money. The majority of Americans, the majority of broke people, spend their money first, and then if there's anything left, they might put a little bit of it into savings. Maybe they'll take some of it and invest it, but we're gonna flip that. You're gonna invest and save first and spend whatever's left. Now that you're putting money aside to invest, let's talk about the different ways that you can actually invest your money, build your wealth, and build true generational wealth. So this is the money that you put aside to invest. This money can either be automatically invested or you can manually take this money and invest it somewhere. And this is gonna depend on your investing strategy and your investing goals. So let's break that all down. There are three questions that you wanna ask here. Number one, what is your investing strategy? Number two, what is your investing goal? And number three, which assets are gonna fulfill the strategy and goal? So let's break this down, starting with what is your investing strategy? And you have two options. You can be what I like to call an active investor or a passive investor. Now, an active investor is somebody who is gonna be more manual and more involved with their investments. Think of this like trying to find a good stock to invest in. Not trade, but invest in. You're trying to find the next hot stock that you wanna own for the next 10 years. Or this could be something like you wanna go out and invest in real estate, so you're gonna go out and find a property to purchase. That's active investing. Passive investing is you want to set it and forget it system. You don't want to be involved. You don't want to read financial statements. You don't want to have to go out and talk to tenants and property managers and deal with the city hall and all that. So now to be a passive investor, you can invest in the stock market by investing in funds, ETFs, mutual funds, and index funds. That way it's passive. It's a set it and forget it system. Your money's automatically invested every week or every two weeks or every month and you set it and forget it. Or when it comes to real estate, instead of you actually operating the deal, you're just gonna invest in somebody else's deal. You hear of an investor who's looking to go out and buy this big apartment project, and you can invest some money into it, so you're a silent investor. Or you find some crowdfunded real estate deal online, and you put some money into it, and you let somebody else operate the deal. Now you're a passive investor getting exposure to real estate, but you're not the one that's actually operated the deal. That's passive investing. And you gotta decide what's right for you, or both. For me, I'm an active investor and a passive investor. Now, I don't recommend what I do to anybody else. I'm just a random guy on YouTube, okay? Investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will lose money at some point, so make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. But for me, I like to diversify against myself. So I have a passive strategy where I invest money into the stock market passively. I have a portfolio of funds that I invest in. This happens every week, whether the market's up or down, and it does not matter. I also have an active strategy where I'm actively investing in real estate. 
I'm actively looking for stocks to invest in. I'm actively investing in startups. So you have to find what's right for you and build a system around that. Once you understand your strategy, the next question is what is your goal? More specifically, would you rather see cash flow or would you rather see appreciation? Now cash flow is when you're gonna go out and you're gonna buy an asset and it pays you for owning it. So when I go out and I invest in real estate, my goal is cash flow. I'm gonna buy this property and then I want this property to pay me every single month and then I wanna use this rental income to pay for all the expenses and then have some profit every single month. This way now I can work to stack the cash flow and I can live off the cash flow. It's the same thing in the stock market. When I invest in stocks, the bulk of my stock market portfolio, the bulk of my passive investments are passive for cash flow. So these are funds that pay dividends. In the stock market, a dividend is when a company has a big profit and then they just pay you this cash for owning that stock every three months, meaning every quarter. So now, every Wednesday, my money is going to buy these funds and then every quarter, these funds pay me with cash flow. And then when I get this cash flow, I can choose to either reinvest the cash flow to buy more of these cash flow producing funds or can I use these funds to build my savings or to go out and spend. And for me, my goal is this cash flow because when I think about generational wealth, I like this idea of owning these assets which spit out this cash flow. That way then I could potentially pass down these assets to somebody else, but that cash flow continues coming. Appreciation is you're buying something and then it goes up in value. And then when many people think about selling or retiring, then you start selling some of these assets. That way you can start to realize that appreciation. So you buy a stock for $100 and it goes up to $1,000 a share. Now you can sell that, pay some taxes, but now you have this cash that you can spend and now you can use this appreciation to live your life. You have to decide what's right for you. For me, the bulk of my investments are for cash flow is because I like investing for cash flow, but a lot of people don't like cash flow because it can be a slow process. But for me, that's what I prefer. I want to work to stack the cash flow so I can live off of my cash flow because that way this cash flow can keep paying me and I can keep spending that money and well, that's a very nice thing to have when your cash flow can pay for all of your expenses. And then the third thing you want to think about is which asset do you want to invest in? Now, the three assets that have built more wealth than anything else over the last century are building a business, investing in stocks, investing in real estate. There are many types of assets out there, but those are the three that have been time tested and proven. And so as you think about now where you invest your money, you might look at startups, you might look at alternative assets, you might look at cryptocurrency, you might look at a lot of things, which is fine, but start with the things that have been proven for the test of time. So now you can decide, well, if you want cash flow or appreciation, what is better? Is it stocks or real estate for you? Which one's gonna allow you to be more active versus passive? Again, stocks and real estate can allow you to be more of an active investor or a passive investor. You just have to decide now what is right for you. Now, there are many different ways you can go about doing this now. You could be a do-it-yourself investor and invest your money yourself, or you can go out and work with a financial advisor. This is where I'm gonna give you a few resources. Feel free to use whatever you want or don't use whatever you want. It's really just up to you, some additional resources. If you are an investor, the first thing you need is you wanna stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets. That's where I created Market Briefs. It's a free newsletter where every day my team is breaking out what's happening in the financial markets. That way you can be a more educated investor. It's a completely free newsletter. If you haven't joined Market Briefs, I have the link for you down in the description. Second, for those of you that are DIY, do-it-yourself stock market investors, fundamental investors, and you want a breakdown of what's happening in the markets that's a more deep dive analysis that can help you find unique investment ideas, so you have more unique investment research, this is where we've also created a Market Briefs Pro newsletter. This is, again, one of those newsletters that's more sophisticated, that is reserved for investors that are actually investing their money, and they want to stay on top of unique market shifts and investment opportunities. If that's something you're interested in, I have the link to where you can learn more about Market Briefs Pro down in the description. You can watch a short video and apply for a content demo. And third, if you want a financial advisor to manage your money for you, that we don't have to worry about any of this, that way somebody can just do it for you, well then I also have a third resource which is called Money Pickle. They are an advertiser. They work best for people, investors, who have a minimum of $100,000 in assets to $3 million plus in assets and then they can help you manage your money, optimize tax strategies, optimize your retirement planning. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can check out our advertiser Money Pickle and be referred to a financial advisor and they can give you a free consultation as well if you qualify. 
So if you want to learn more about that, I have that link for you down in the description below as well. Now that you've built a financial system and now that you know how to invest your money, let's talk about how you can spend your money smartly. This is where you really want to understand the difference between an asset and a liability. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. You buying food is a liability. You paying for your house is a liability. Your car is a liability. Your vacation is a liability. Now these things might be necessary, but they are liabilities. And this is where I want you to focus on buying the assets before the liabilities. But the reality is you gotta have liabilities. You gotta eat. You need a roof over your head. You need a car. You have to buy things. And this is where you wanna be able to control your spending and be smart with your spending. And what I mean by that is if it doesn't put money in your pocket, if it is not an asset, stop financing it. This is one of the, the key drivers of building wealth for the average person and even the wealthy is you buy things that you can afford, period. If you don't have the money to buy it with cash, you can't afford it. The exception to this is your house, but your car, your vacations, that Gucci purse, if you don't have the cash to buy it, don't buy it. Wait until you can buy it. And this is difficult today because I know in today's culture, it's super easy to buy things with buy now, pay later, with 0% APR, with a whole bunch of credit cards. I mean, it's very common. Everybody does it nowadays. But if you don't want to live like everybody else, you can't keep doing what the majority of people do. I mean, this channel is called the minority mindset because it's all about thinking differently than the majority of people. And if you keep doing what the majority of people do, you're going to end up like the majority of people. And unfortunately, that means you're going to be fat, unhappy, and broke. You don't want that. And so if you don't want to do what the majority of people do, you can't keep living like the majority of people. That means you gotta stop financing things. And then if you wanna take it one step further and be more aggressive, one of the things that I like to live by is the rule of five, which says, if it's not something that I need to survive and I can't buy five of them, I can't afford one of them. This way, I know that when I wanna buy something nice, I better be able to afford it comfortably so I don't have to worry about the price. That way, it doesn't dig into my actual ability to build wealth. Now that we're chugging along, let's talk about number eight, how you can earn more money strategically and be smart with it. Let's take a minute and let's dream about a hypothetical situation. Let's imagine that you could make an additional $10,000 a month, every month, an additional $10,000 hits your bank account. What would you do? Now, when I ask the average person this, what they would tell you is, well, I'm going to go out and buy myself a new car. I'm going to buy a new house. I'm going to go to Cancun. I'm going to go on a fancy vacation and buy a whole bunch of nice things. Because we think in terms of spending. But this is where I want you to flip that and remember this, that the goal is to invest and save before you spend your money. And if you do that, you can become wealthier faster. The fastest way to accelerate your path to wealth, being financially free and never having to worry about money again, is to increase your investments before you increase your spending. So remember this, as you earn more money, to at least follow something like this, where you have a 75, 15, 10 plan in place, where if you make an additional $10,000 a month, you make an additional $100 a month, or you make an additional million dollars a month, you're always investing and saving this money before you spend all this money. Now, how do you go out and earn more money? And this is gonna depend on you, but what happens to a lot of people is you start going down this financial journey, and then you say, huh, I like this financial education stuff, I like this investing stuff, I'm actually seeing this wealth start to happen. I'm actually starting to see this wealth start to build. It doesn't happen overnight, I call it a decade of sacrifice, because the first few years, you're gonna see nothing. But the few years after that, you start to see a little bit. The few years after that, you start to see a little bit more. And then the last few years in this decade of sacrifice, this is where your wealth really starts to accelerate. And this decade of sacrifice means you go through a decade of spending less and earning more so you can invest like crazy. But now, as you're working to figure out how do you earn more money, the question is, how do you actually go about doing it? Now, some of you are gonna say, I hate the idea of starting a business. I hate the idea of starting a side hustle. That's not for me. Okay, that's fine. But maybe you can find ways to earn more money where you are. Maybe you can ask for a raise. There are a bunch of great channels, great classes, great books on how to ask for a raise at the job that you're at right now. Maybe you can work to take on a second job. Maybe you can work to get a job change. Maybe you work to get a career change. There's a bunch of certificates that you can take online that can help you qualify for a new job or a new career where you can earn more money. Maybe you say, I'm a little bit more entrepreneurial. I wanna go out and start a side hustle. I wanna go start a business. Great, I'm not gonna go into how do you build a business in this video, but you have an unlimited number of opportunities. The key is now, you wanna actually put in the effort to start learning to earn more money. And when you start thinking in that sense, you will find ways to earn more money. Because here's why this is so important. If you make $50,000 a year right now, there's a limit to how many pennies you can squeeze out of this pie. 
you might say, yeah, I can, I can squeeze 15% to invest. Maybe I can squeeze 17%. I can squeeze an extra few hundred dollars to invest. But there's a limit because you still gotta eat. You still have to pay for your house. I mean, yeah, maybe you can live in your car, but there's a limit to how many pennies you can pinch. But if you can take this from $50,000 a year to $500,000 a year, now every additional percentage of your income that you invest is a lot more dollars. And let me tell you something, it's easier to live off of $300,000 a year and invest and save $200,000 than it is to live off of $30,000 and save and invest $20,000. Now you're gonna say, well, Dustbreak, how in the world am I gonna go from $50,000 to $500,000? But this is where you wanna start working towards something bigger. Remember we talked about in the beginning, building that abundance mindset. This is what it's all about. There's a lot of money in the world. You just have to figure out how you can extract a little bit of it for yourself. How can you create this new value? How do you do this? Start watching YouTube videos on how to grow your income. Start reading books on how to grow your income. And maybe you go from 50,000 to 100,000. Maybe you go from 50,000 to 75,000. Maybe you go from 50,000 to 250,000. In any case, all of these are more than where you are now. But now the key is as you earn more money, you're working to follow a system. So you're investing your money first. Now let's talk about number nine, which is asset protection. And to the average person, this is where things get very boring and dry. But as an attorney who is not your attorney, let me tell you this. This is going to be one of the most important things. And as you build more wealth, you will find yourself spending a lot of time, effort, energy, and money here. So it's better to start planning for this and understanding this sooner because it can save you a whole lot of time, effort, energy, headache, and money in the future. So asset protection is all about how do you protect yourself. And there's many different layers of this. The first thing is, as you start investing your money into different asset classes like real estate or building your own business, you gotta get yourself a good attorney. And you might have to go through a few different attorneys to find a good attorney, but you wanna find a good attorney. If you're investing in real estate, find an attorney who specializes in real estate. If you're building a business, find an attorney who specializes not just in building a business, but in the industry that you're in. So if you're building a guacamole business, find an attorney who specializes in the food services industry. If you're doing something online, find an attorney that specializes in internet businesses, digital businesses, e-commerce businesses, YouTube businesses, whatever it might be, that's gonna save you a lot of headache because there's a lot of general attorneys out there that will tell you that yeah, it's all the same stuff. It is not. Okay, I am saying this because I have learned the hard way, even as an attorney, finding different types of attorneys, you wanna find an attorney that specializes in what you do. Then you wanna get yourself a good accountant, especially if you're building a business, especially if you're investing in real estate. You need to have a good accountant on your side because the tax code is a very complex thing. In fact, I will show you. This is a copy of the Federal Income Tax Code. It is thousands of pages long with this very tiny font because there are many different nuances in the Federal Income Tax Code. It is not worth your time, effort, and energy to read this and understand this. Get a good attorney and get a good accountant who can help you with this. Now, if you just work a job and you're investing your money in your 401k, it's not gonna make sense for you to spend thousands of dollars to find an accountant because the deductions and things that you can do are very limited, but it might make sense to spend a couple hundred dollars, depending on how much money you're making, to have an accountant or to have some firm review what you're filing in your taxes. So as you make more, as you get more sophisticated in your accounting, this is where you can take a look at different options. And then of course you have the insurances. You have your health insurance, you have your home insurance, you have your car insurance, you have your life insurance. All of these are things that you wanna think about and have because insurance is a small price you pay to protect you a big cost in the future. Now, if you get into business or real estate, you're gonna have a whole new set of insurances that you're gonna need as well for that. But I know it is a very annoying cost to pay. Nobody likes to pay for insurance but it can save you a huge headache. Now, if you want some assistance finding insurances, many different companies online, but our advertiser, Policy Genius, I'm a big fan of them, especially when it comes to things like life insurance, because they do a very good job at helping you shop and find the best rate possible and finding the best insurance possible. So if you wanna learn more about Policy Genius and see how you can get a free life insurance quote, again, I have that link for you down in the description as well. And this brings us to number 10, which is how do you leave your legacy? Now there's a couple things that I wanna talk about this. Number one, as you build more wealth, you have the ability to give more. I'm of the belief that the more you have, the more you can do. And the nice thing about this is when you build wealth and when you build wealth strategically, when you have the right attorneys and you build the right estate planning, this is your will and your trust, you can continue to impact the world long after that you're gone. 
after you pass away, you can continue to help the world through your legacy. Now, you can help the world when you're alive through the work that you do, through the time that you give, through the money that you give. But this is where you can be strategic as well of how you can leave a legacy and how you can continue to leave this legacy even beyond your time as well. And this is where you can be strategic through your estate planning. For example, if you own assets that are paying you with cash flow, you can pass down this asset to whoever you want and then distribute this cash flow however you want. So if there are certain charities, certain organizations that you want to continue giving to even after you're gone, well, you can arrange for that. This is what your legacy is all about. And this is where if you know how you want to leave your mark on the world, having more money can help you with that. Do you need money? Maybe not. But can it help you? Absolutely. And this is where as you earn more, remember that you can give back. And the more you give, well, it's good, I believe. And that's where now you can truly build the generational wealth because now not only do you have the ability to educate the future generation, you have the ability to help them understand the assets and you can also pass down the assets as well. And of course, there's a whole business in how do you actually pass down assets, which I'm not gonna get into in this video. But if you enjoyed learning these 10 steps of building wealth and using your money the right way, let me know down in the comments and what you'd like to see more of. That way we can work to create more of that type of content. When most people think of generational wealth, they're thinking, I own this home that's worth $600,000 with a $500,000 mortgage. Then I'm gonna work to pay down my mortgage to $0. That way then I can pass down this house to my kids. But that's not what real generational wealth looks like. Real generational wealth looks more like this. 